Welcome to Buckets. My name's Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. This is your playoff workshop for Tuesday. Game twos are on tap. The Atlanta Hawks try and get back into the series versus the Miami Heat. The Minnesota Timberwolves try and go up 2-0 on the road as the upset dog versus the Memphis Grizzlies. And the Phoenix Suns continue their quest to absolutely vanquish everything in their path behind the point god and CP3. We'll break it down. Sides, props, totals, the works. Everything you need to know about the NBA playoffs is in the Action Network app. Download it right now. You're going to get up to the second information on where the bets and money are coming in. Like on the first game we're going to talk about today with professional better Raheem Palmer and NBA futures analyst Brandon Anderson. The first game on the slate, the Atlanta Hawks taking on the Miami Heat. Hawks got absolutely destroyed on Sunday behind a terrible shooting performance, which we're going to talk about in a second. 36% of the tickets are on the Hawks but 50% of the money right now in the Action Network app with a pretty substantial amount of tickets already in. Uh, the money line in this game, also fascinating, 8% of the tickets are on the Hawks, 49% of the money that we're tracking coming in on the Hawks to win this game outright. Over under in this game, 219 and a half. 84% of the tickets are on the over, 19% of the money. So 81% of the money is coming in on the under 219 and a half. Raheem Palmer, let's start with you. First, how do you react to a game like game one where they absolutely blew them out? What do you, how do you think that, that should affect the spread? If at all, it only went from seven to seven and a half in this one. And what do you think the angle is to playing game two? Look, it's tough to, you never really want to overreact to a bad shooting night like we saw in that game. I mean, look, the Hawks, they could not get it going from three. They were 10 of 36 from behind the arc. That's 27%. And they were just 38% from the field. They were 29 of 75. And you typically don't want to overreact to that. But this Hawks offense has struggled all year long against this Heat team. So this could just be a bad matchup. And also one of the things that when it comes to the Hawks for me is that this is a team where I really don't like playing them on the road. Like their home and road splits are very, very damning. Like, look, they're just 16 and 25 straight up and 14 and 27 against the spread on the road this season. So I'm not surprised by what we saw. Me personally, I don't want to be on the Hawks in this matchup. Now, I think the the sharp money coming in on the under is an indication that they feel like this is this is more of an expectation than rather just a one game blip. So I'm not mad at the under, but I would be looking Miami or pass. Let me ask you something. When we, let's just talk about this for a second. When we've got a playoff series which is such a direct matchup. How much do you weigh in how teams are performed on the road versus at home in the regular season when the variance is, I I think there's something to be done in the regular season with home road splits. I get a little, I'm a little skeptical of like how that translate in the playoff environment. I mean, well, I, I think it does translate because at the end of the day, home foot advantage is worth, well, home court advantage is worth a lot more in the postseason. Okay. So, if you struggle on the road, I, I think that carries over. And look, I think that's why we see those game two trends. I mean, those game three trends where you have the Sharps backing the the home team down 0-2. So. Yeah, so I, my, look, my, my impulse on this was to go Heat. Um, but I'll say this, the Heat shot 9.3% better on EFG than expected in this game. Yeah. And the Atlanta Hawks shot 5.8% worse. I think that second number is actually really interesting here, right? Because if you told me that the Hawks shot absolutely horribly, I would be like, oh, so they really probably like they, they were the difference was probably massive. It wasn't, it wasn't that big. It was only 6% versus like the Pelican shot 10.6% worse than expected. The Grizzlies shot 8.9% worse than expected. We'll get to them in a second. The Hawks really, they had a low expect, expected field goal percentage. Like even factoring shooter, this is not location and contest level. This is these shooters in this environment, 48.9 is the expected field goal percentage. Uh, only the Bulls and Jazz were worse this weekend 
uh, and the Nets by a small margin in terms of their expected field goal percentage. With shooters, it's actually up to 51, sorry. It's 51%. That one's really low too. So I don't necessarily buy that the the Hawks are going to shoot better. The Heat put up a 118 offensive rating. So I think this is an interesting question of, is seven enough to get you behind the idea of the Heat are going to cool down offensively, even if the Hawks struggle, but then you've got the bad Hawks defense and Miami being able to run off of misses. So I don't know, like I kind of, I kind of lean towards a stay away. I'll tell you like my lean right now, and we'll see where I get to by tomorrow. My lean right now, I think is on Atlanta, Brandon. I think just from the perspective of can they really shoot that t- like even if it's we just believe it's the Miami and the switch defense and I think all of that matters I still think that there's a wide enough gap here for them to to get there I just part of it is closing with six and a half on on heat this is only seven and a half it's a point it's not enough for me like I need nine and a half in order to feel good about betting Atlanta in this Yeah, so I was on the other side on game one. I was on Atlanta in this one, and I liked Atlanta in the series. We talked about some of those advantages that I thought would be there. And so I'm finding myself kind of in the opposite spot here is I saw the shooting. I saw the shooting numbers. Like, look, first half shooting, both of these teams took 19 threes in the first half. Atlanta was 2 of 19. Miami was 10 of 19. That is literally a 24-point swing on three-point shots in the first half it's over. If you do that in a half, every team loses that game or wins, depending on which side you're on. Like that's it. So I'm all of my instincts say, don't overreact here. The problem is that I was already feeling pretty good about Atlanta. And so I'm wondering how do I make sure I don't underreact here? Because the shooting variance thing is real. Like that's going to even out some, I don't know how much, Miami's three-point percentage has been top five for them all year and top five defensively against opponents all year. That's their thing. That's what they do. So I don't know that we can just throw that out entirely. I I will say, you know, Matt, you said that EFG is like uh, Atlanta is maybe uh, is negative five, but it's not just the negative five. It's that Miami is plus nine too. That's a 14% swing. If you combine the two of them of like, there's a lot of evening out to come, but can the Hawks beat the switch? Can Trey Young show up? Trey had eight points, six turnovers, one of 12 shooting. And that's not new against this team. Five games against the Heat now for this season. He's had yet to have double digit assists in any game, which that's a lot, but not for Trey. It's not. He's averaging 6.6 assists, 22 points, three rebounds a game. So I looked as the props guy, I looked at assists. I was like, oh, here we go. Give me a single digit assist line. Oh, they're ahead of it. They already dropped the assist line down to 8.5. That's how they know this is going. Even so, he's gone under 8.5 assists in four of the five games against the Heat this year. So I'm looking at Trey Young under 39.5 points, rebounds, and assists. He's gone under that four out of the five. You're always at risk because Trey maybe just gets hot and scores 35 points, and then you're just done. Like he's if he scores 35, you're not going under 40 PRA. But yeah, I don't know. I I feel like that there's still it, – it feels like this is the spot to bet Atlanta because you don't want to overreact. But I just bet Atlanta, and I don't really want to lose money on this team that way twice in a row. So I feel a little bit stuck. Like it's, it's going to be a game for me where I don't bet a lot. It's going to be a small spot for me. So Bogdanovich had the worst – game of anybody i think for Mm -hmm. for atlanta when you look at kind of expectation Mm -hmm. versus what they actually did right and his he didn't have a necessarily low expected field goal percentage either which kind of Mm -hmm. factors into this a little bit for me when i'm trying to like find a spot here so I, i think if you've got a switch and you're putting all this defensive pressure on on trey there's got to be like an outlet here where there even with the switch there should be some sort of like come back the other way like Bogdanovich in this game on lightly contested shots was O of one uh on heavily contested like they, they got up under him but he was O of seven heavily contested right hit an open one for me I do kind of look at Bogdanovich as maybe a guy that responds in this spot and maybe has a better game when his prop comes up I think I'll probably be looking at um 
a little bit more creation from him, maybe points and assists. Cause he's mm-hmm. a guy that I do kind of, even if he's hot and cold, I feel like there's an opportunity for him to maybe, okay, if he's playing against Duncan Robinson, attack that switch a little bit more, right? Fine. They're going to have to pick on some of these guys a little bit. And I think Bogdanovich might be a little bit better suited to attack some of it rather than Trey that's facing three levels of defense. There's got to be a little bit on the weak side in order for him to attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think you like actually that Bogdanovich is coming off the bench here because with Miami reshaping their lineup late in the year, like the, there are, there is no more guys in the starting lineup to pick on that. That was the problem for Atlanta is they, they couldn't find that mismatch. The mismatches are hiding on de- uh, in the second string, but when bogey comes in now he can go find some of those mismatches and there's going to be some of those. So his, you know, Kevin Herter is the other guy that could, you know, take some of the load and he's going to play more with Trey, but his median, like his numbers are a lot closer to median. Bogdanovich is a lot more like all or nothing. So for me, if you do want to play him, I, I'm not looking to ne- necessarily play a points prop, but I would play an alternate over. Maybe if I like him, I want to see him hit 20 points or 25 points. You know, some of those milestones that they put up where, if he does get hot and suddenly hits like five threes in that game or something, like, I think, I think that's a spot where if you like it for Bogdanovich, you need to really like it. And then maybe you even think about parlaying it with an Atlanta win too, okay. because I think if he shows up, I think you have to really go in for it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I might stay away from that one. I will say this Raheem to me, the best angle here is a uh, heat under one thirteen and a half. and a half expect some regression offensively. Look at the pace yeah. of this game via four factors. 86 and 85 is the possession averages for, for both teams over at four, uh, over at clean the glass. Like mm-hmm. that's slow. And so for me, it's okay. The heat are probably going to cool down a little bit. The Hawks will make more shots to make it a little bit harder running against a set defense. The switching is always going to slow stuff down a little bit at one thirteen and a half. That's a high enough number that I think I like the under on Miami's team total. I like that. I definitely like that. It's, it's interesting, though. We're seeing this total go up. This, this total up in 217. We're up to 219 in some spots. Mm. I, I'm wondering if we want to fade that line move. Because, I mean, I think the, the market is basically saying that Atlanta is going to score more, but it's assuming that Miami's offense is going to remain as efficient. Mm, okay. Yeah, and Duncan Robinson had eight of nine threes. P.G. Tucker is four for four. Like, we're yeah. just – we're not getting that shooting performance again. It is worrisome. The mm. Heat had 35 assists on 43 made baskets. Like that's that's it's a great ratio if you're in Miami, but it's really easy to get rack up assists when you pass it to a guy on the wing and he hits a three every time. So all of this yeah. and they score 115. So yeah, I'm gonna go <laughs> under on yeah, like, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, and I, it, it was interesting because you watched the first five minutes of the game and it was like Miami couldn't score. Yeah. Like it felt like they should have been up 15, 20 points and it was still a game going into the second quarter. And then they just started shooting lights out. So I think that first quarter is more indicative of what we will see than the rest of the game. All right. So second game on the night, we've got the Minnesota Timberwolves taking on the Memphis Grizzlies second game in the grindhouse uh, totals 241 now up from 237 and a half. I believe it closed in game one. Uh, Grizzlies are seven point favorites, roughly about where they were at in game one. I bet, I bet Minnesota in that spot. I bet Minnesota win the series talked about why on the series preview. I feel good after game one, but I'm going to be on Memphis in the spot. Um, for a lot of reasons. One, shot variance went heavily, heavily, heavily towards Minnesota in this one to the degree that like it makes me honestly a little bit nervous about those season, about the series price. But part of me thinks like, well, I think if the, if it tells, this is what it's going to look like. But I think holding it in consecutive games is difficult. Um, Wolves shot 5.8% better than expected on a very low expected percentage, like 53.1, which is not high at all. Like for comparison, um, that's worse than what new Orleans was expected to shoot. And the Wolves shot almost six points better than that on effective field goal percentage. Memphis, on the other hand, had a 58.3% expected uh, to put that in comparison. The golden state warriors were only at 54.4 and Memphis shot 8.9% worse. So instead of using the numbers, I'll just tell you this Memphis shot way, way, way worse than expected on a high expectation effective field goal percentage Minnesota shot decently better 
than a fairly low one. And that's how you come out with this outcome. I still like the matchups for Minnesota. I still don't like the Grizzlies in the half court, which I think leads to some of this. But I think game two at home can't go down at 0-2. The Wolves will be happy with the, with the split. Um, all of that combined. Plus, this is, you know, the Wolves will have had an extra day. They've been in Memphis on the layover. They're not coming back to Minnesota, so they're staying there. It's a longer road trip. Bunker mentality can be good. That's a long time, I think, on the road. So... I like Memphis here minus seven. I'm leaning towards the under again. I lost it in game one. I talked about this on the pod last night with Brandon Raheem, that if you look at the first quarter, it's wild. Like the first quarter was a 108 pace. The second half was 101. So things grinded down in that second half. I do kind of wonder, like, I, but I, the reason I'll probably stay away from the total is Memphis may be a little bit more relentless in running in this one. And Minnesota may not have the energy to slow them down. It's very actually, tough to, to get back on that, that much. You actually hinted on an angle I really, really like for this okay. game. Um, look, Memphis is the highest scoring first quarter team in the league this season. I think their totals this year are they've gone 48 and 33 to the over in the first quarter. To me, I think Memphis is going to come out relentless. Like you said, they're going to push the pace. I like Memphis's team total over first quarter, 31 and a half. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. And I I think you could take it for the first half too. But there are some interesting trends involving this game. Look, a lot of people like to talk about the zigzag theory. But the zigzag theory doesn't work in the way that it does in the past. I think you got to be a little bit more selective. So if you look at, if you isolate that, that down to top three seeds coming off a of game one loss, they're 28 and 16. That's 64% against the spread. You look last year, we had this occur three times. We had the Milwaukee Bucks. They lost game one to the Atlanta Hawks. What did they do the following game? They blew them out. We had the Utah Jazz lose game one to this very same Memphis Grizzlies team. What did they do game two? They blew them out. They had the Philadelphia 76ers. They lost game one. Well, actually, they they didn't cover game one. Game two, they they blew them out. They also lost game one against the Hawks. They blew them out. Um, You want to go back even further. Boston Celtics, 2019. They beat the Milwaukee Bucks. Game two, Milwaukee Bucks blew blew them out. So I think this is a great trend. I think you want to be looking Memphis. I think Matt named all the all the great reasons, the shot quality. I think shot quality actually had this game. Memphis 127, Timberwolves 112. So that that'll tell you that Memphis is the spot here. Brandon, what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking to bet Memphis here. It's it feels very much like a young Timberwolves team showed up in Memphis won a game one for the second time in franchise history, got the job done. And then Memphis counter punches. And then it just, it's too easy for me to see Minnesota being like, well, you know, job done. We, so, okay. Okay. Settle down Memphis. We're it's still one, one scoreboard. We're going back to Minnesota. We got our win. I just, it's, it's too easy for me to see when, that barrage comes that we know is going to come with this team, with this crowd in Memphis. I don't know that I see Minnesota ready to respond to that as well. So I'm with you on that. I'm looking to play Grizzlies second quarters, I think, in this series. The bench unit, when it came on last game, that was when, like, the Minnesota starters were really good. When the bench unit came in for Memphis, we know, like, that's the whole thing, their depth. And they just mashed. Nas Reed was terrible for a lot of that game for Minnesota. So I think that could be a spot to back the Memphis uh, to back Memphis if they're struggling a little early or even like the second quarter, I think, is a chance where they pull away a little bit. And then the the big thing here for me and Matt, I know you're on this, too, but there is one of the worst prop lines I've seen for a long time in this game. And it's Stephen Adams rebounding line, Stephen Adams lines in general. So we've talked a lot about this already. I, I just don't think Stephen Adams can stay on the court in the series. And I love in playoff series, I love around game two and game three to bet unders on these guys, especially big guys who are about to go out of the rotation. I think that Steven Adams could get nerfed so much in this, in this series 
he might not even get props listed by the end of the series. Like they're not going to be willing to put lines up for him. If this trends the way I think it's going, he's still getting over under 10 and a half rebounds. So last game, I think he only played 24 minutes last game and really struggled in those minutes. He was minus 15 in the first half this season. When Adams plays 22 minutes or fewer, he's gone under that line 16 out of 21 games. And by the way, he had three rebounds in game one. His three of his four worst rebounding totals of the season are all against the Timberwolves. He has games of two rebounds, three rebounds, three rebounds, three of his worst four all season. Joe Delaire pointed this out though. Even better is you can just play the under 20.5 points, rebounds, assists, because why not just boost the line? It's not like Stephen Adams is going to go out and drop 14 points on you. Like this is not a guy that scores a lot of points or, you know, racks up five or six assists. Why not just boost the line up even higher? It's still even odds on that at 22 minutes or fewer. He's gone under that line 20 out of 21 games this season. They only missed it one time. And I think by like a bucket in those games, he's under 10 or fewer points, rebounds, assists in three of the four Minnesota games this season. It's just, it's the drop thing. It's the, he can't get out to cover these shooters. Minnesota has, we should have seen it coming. I, I will be betting this very aggressively. You can bet Steven Adams on over under 9.1 rebounds per game for the series. I think that's an insane number that should be way lower. That's at DraftKings. Uh, at points bet. You can bet over under 11 rebounds and do the thing like the points betting style where you get to win extra, depending on how far under he goes. I think Adam's going to have like two, three, four rebounds and just not even have a huge role in this game or in the series. Uh, I am looking at, so I think there's a correlation here that we could probably play. I think you should bet that Adams by itself, but I will just ask this. Like if we do Jaron Jackson, who we think gets those minutes. Yeah. And we do under under we, Adams over Jackson under nine and a half for Adams over seven plus for Jaron. We're at plus four seventy five. Oh, 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 you know what I'm, I'm I'm thinking. I'm thinking a little different. Okay. The way Jaron Jackson gets in foul trouble. Yeah. I wonder if you want to take one of the wings. I can't get Brandon Clark. That's the problem. That's what I, know, I, I looked for Clark too. I don't. I don't uh, want Jackson. Jackson's not a great rebounder, and he gets the foul trouble. Yeah. So it's I, like, I have the exact same thought as you. Like, well. If Adams isn't playing, somebody's gonna have to rebound for Memphis. And I, I mean, I, even if I, I even if it's too. even if it's um, damn, we can't get like Kyle. Even, That's the problem is I can't get any of the wings. Yeah, it's gonna have to like yeah. I don't want to take I don't want to take Bain. I don't want to take Dylan. I don't want either of those guys. I only want the bench. I want the bench dudes. I want yeah. Brandon yeah. Clark and Kyle Anderson. If I can, if those pop up anywhere, I'll bet those. Yeah, I'm watching for. I haven't seen them. So, I gotta tell you, you Stephen Adams. You need Clark at, and Anderson at FanDuel. Stephen Adams is minus fifty thousand to have four or more rebounds. Like, how do I fade that? Well, what price do you give me to have not four or more rebounds? He's literally under that number in three of the four Timberwolves games. Well, here's this here's a, the number on the if you you can take that same game parlay. If you do the under uh, eight hmm. and a half, it's plus two hundred on the same game. So, like, hmm. bet if you want to. If you're so certain on that, bet that with the money line both ways. Interesting. So that you're going to get a good payoff. So um, let, let me, let me ask you, cause uh, Matt, I know you were on the Timberwolves on the series. Obviously the one game one, I know you like them. We all like Memphis here. So I found a few, I try to think of like, okay, if you want to bet the wolves in the series, I've got three options for you. Tell me which one of these three you guys like best. You do wolves minus one and a half is plus 175 at bet MGM. So that's wolves to win. Basically wolves to win the series, not in game seven. That's that plus 175. You bet Wolves to win game two and the series at plus 250. Or sorry, Grizz to win game two, Wolves to win the series, which is I think what you think is going to happen, Matt, is plus 250. Or you can bet Wolves plus 180 to lose in the conference semis, which is win the series and then play the Warriors. I think those are all better ways to play it than just playing the Wolves at this point. I don't think so. I, I still like just playing the Wolves. Um, I think if you, you're if getting you like a better them, price though, he, on all these, but that's not always it. Like I, I got to factor in a bunch of stuff there. Like what if uh, like Steph gets hurt? Like if I, if I bet second round and Steph gets hurt and it's just, and all of a sudden it's the warriors and that like spirals or, or worse Draymond 
honestly, with Poole playing the way that he is, like, what if Draymond gets hurt, right? Uh, if it's not to lose in seven, what if it's game six and the Wolves just have a meltdown, right? Like, you could hedge it, and that's fine, but you don't like he- like hedging. And then the third one was game two and win the series. I don't, that one's the one I like the best. That one, I, that one I like the best is, is, is Grizzlies win game two, Wolves win the series, because I do think it's, it's Wolves and six. So of the options, I like that. That's the one that I like the best. Um, I, think, I think that's the way I would approach it anyway. But to me, it's like, why lock that in now? Yeah. Um, like, why do, you, why do you need to lock that in now? Because look, I, I, I approach everything as like, everything is a data point. We don't know what's good. I mean, obviously, we like Memphis in this game, but we don't know if we're going to see something in this game that's concerning. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, and it's just like, it's I not, would rather. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if the Wolves won this game. I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not going to bet it. But it's like, I would rather wait until after this game and then reevaluate and then say, you know what? I still like the Bulls. I mean, I like the Wolves going home. Yeah. And especially if the, if the Grizzlies win, I might be, get a good price on just Wolves win the series outright anyway. Cause they'll be like, well, okay, they lost that first game, but. Um, let's go to the last game and Mm -hmm. we'll get out of here. So, because I don't think we're going to have much on this game. I can't imagine us having a lot on this game. The new Orleans Pelicans taking on the Phoenix suns. Uh, the suns are minus nine and a half. I opened 10 and a half and it's moved down a point. That's a little interesting. Totals 221. It's down from an open at 222 and a half. So that's down a point two. Uh, not a lot of tickets so far on this one. Early indications are that the Suns are taking on most of the tickets. Don't have a money count yet on them. Uh, Phoenix is all over the money spreads that we've got on this this ticket so far. Uh, the over splits are 57% to the under, 93% of the money. So the money's coming in. This looks like it's going to be moving towards the under. By the time that you hear this, it might be down a couple more points. Um, Raheem, I'm not touching this one. I don't want to mess with this. I thought the Pelicans played pretty well in the second half. If I have any lean, it's Suns, just because I feel like the Pelicans kind of had a chance last night and they blew it. And so if I'm going any direction, I'm going Suns minus nine and a half, but I don't want to lay the 10. I'm staying away from this game. This game is, it's, it's very ugly. And I think the big reason why is because I think the Pelicans have a real shot to cover this game and make it a game. When you look at that first half, like their first half was pretty much as bad as what Atlanta did yesterday. I mean, they were 11 for 40, 49, 22% from the field, four for 15 from three. Now we know the Suns have a good defense, but their defense isn't that bad. But the one thing that stood out about this game is, look, DeAndre Ayton was probably the best player in the game. He was absolutely dominant. But at the same time, the Pelicans got every single offensive rebound. They had a 45% offensive rebound rate. And if that continues, we're looking at a game in which I, I think the, the Pelicans are just going to get more shot attempts. Like the Pelicans had 95 shot attempts yesterday to the, to the Phoenix Suns, 78. So I think they're live for the cover. I mean, obviously they got it down to six in the fourth quarter. And then Chris Paul showed us why he's a future Hall of Fame point guard. But I kind of will be looking towards the Pelicans, but I don't want to play it. I don't want to fade this Phoenix Suns team at home. Right. I think if they – what happened? No, I just said like I'm with you. Like I don't want to. I don't. It's like yeah. oh, there's all these like angles, and it's like, do you want to bet against the Suns? No, no, I do not want to bet against Chris Paul. That's not a thing I want to do. Yeah, it's like I I don't want to bet against it. So it's just I'd rather sit this one out. And I guess you know maybe if you if you feel good about things in Game Three, you could take the Pelicans. But I don't even know if I'm going to do it there because I just think the only thing that's going to give you is that the Suns are going to get a lower number. They're going to be on the road and. You can get them to cover, so I'm I'm good. <laughs> Brandon, you got anything on this one? Yeah, thankfully, my one game preview I am assigned to write for the whole week is this game. Yay, Suns game two, hooray! So I do have some angles actually. So here's where here's what I like. I go the other way on the Pelicans thing. They had 25 offensive rebounds. They shot 39 percent on three, and they still didn't score 100 points. I played their team total under yesterday, and it coasted to a victory. And I'm playing it again under one and a half point five or sorry, one Oh five point five. I just, I don't see how they're going to score. They're not going to get 45% offensive rebounding again. Like that's the high water mark. That's going to regress some. And you know, that's a thing that Phoenix is going to focus on because you have to, when you're getting hammered like that, they're going to shoot worse on threes. Probably they're going to have half as many offensive rebounds. Uh, 
the Pelicans shot under 38% on two pointers. They, they just cannot score in this game uh, against this team. So I like Pelicans team total under, I like the Suns to sweep still is plus 170. I think there's still value on the number. I, I honestly think it should be pretty, not far from a coin flip. If you look at the implied odds, they're 83% to win this game at minus 500. And Raheem, you, you and I talk about this a lot. If you go up 2-0, you, you basically play in a game three money line now. So unless you really think the Pelicans are going to win this game, which I don't think any of us do at all, then you're getting a plus 170 for Phoenix to just go to New Orleans, take care of business, win game three. New Orleans not coming out to win game four when they're going down 0-3 to the Suns. No, not happening. So I, I like that. The math is in the favor. Last one. Talk me out of this. The Suns to win the series minus two and a half. So the only way you lose that bet is the Pelicans have to win twice. That line is minus 265 at DraftKings. Tell me why that's not free money. How are the Pelicans winning twice in the series? No, I like that. I, I'm willing to pay yeah. the 265. If you're if you're willing to put the money in on it, if you're willing to pay the juice, if you're just like, if you're a better that's like, I don't care about the juice, my certainty is high enough. I that's totally good. Like, I think that's yeah. completely reasonable. That, that's at DraftKings. Yeah. There, there's Pelicans minus win two, 265 at DraftKings, 275 at Bet MGM. I just I don't know what has to happen for them for the Pelicans to win twice in the series. It's Pelicans to win less than two games, Raheem. Oh yeah, they have to kidnap Chris Paul like the movie yeah. Celtic Pride. It, it doesn't. I, I'm not even worried about that. The Suns without Chris Paul still, yeah. I don't think, give up yeah, two wins so. to this series. So yeah, uh, I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. That's gonna mm. wrap it up for the workshop. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. We'll be mm. doing these live at, at 1 p.m. Eastern daily Tuesday through Friday. Check that out. We've got bet spaces. We've got heat check tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Lots of stuff for you. Make sure to follow Action Network HQ on Twitter at NBA bet on Twitter and download the action network app. Thanks for joining us. Let's get buckets.